This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our distinguished guest today is Ronald M. George, who was the 27th Chief Justice of California from 1996 until 2010. During that period, he headed the Supreme Court of California and the Judicial Council of California. Mr. Chief Justice, welcome to Berkeley. Very happy to be here. Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Los Angeles, uh, the son of two immigrants to the United States. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, I believe that they shaped it in two senses, really. They gave me this idea that perhaps going into the diplomatic service would be a career worth considering. I did consider and reject it. And um, secondly, they really instilled in me a great appreciation, as immigrants often have, for the basic rights and responsibilities conferred by our form of government. And, and was there talk about legal issues around the dinner table, world events, politics? Certainly world events and politics, not legal. And uh, I'm the first person in the family to have undergone a legal education. So that was not a focus of my parents, but it ultimately ended up blending very well with the idea of public service that they instilled in me. Mm -hmm. And, and I, since I have a Chief Justice here, I can't help asking, did you watch Perry Mason when you were younger? No, I wasn't <laughs> particularly fascinated with the legal system. In fact, it was only after I became disillusioned with the idea of diplomatic service that I decided to go to law school, and then that blended with the idea of public service. W were there any experiences uh, when you were young uh, that uh, drew your attention to problems of inequality and discrimination? Because this is a theme, uh, both in, in your decisions and in your efforts to reorganize the judiciary in California. Well, uh, preparatory to starting uh, my college undergraduate career back east, I did take a trip with my parents through the South, and we visited the usual attractions, uh, Monticello and Mount Vernon and so forth, and I was quite shocked to see the degree of segregation that still existed at that time. And this was the late uh, 1950s, and to see segregated restroom and uh, restaurants and uh, drinking fountains and so forth. And I'm sure that that impacted me in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, when, before you went away to college, in, did you have any teachers or mentors that, that really influenced you and pushed, made you think about the direction your life would go? I had a wonderful high school teacher who instilled in me an interest in international affairs, and I think that reinforced my idea of going to Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and studying languages preparatory to entering the diplomatic service. And in fact, that was my goal until the summer between my sophomore and junior years when traveling with a friend of mine through West Africa, and this friend was going to visit his parents who were posted in West Africa as part of the diplomatic service. I, in the course of that, decided that that was not the course of career that I wished to pursue. And so, in terms of your uh, higher education, Princeton, and then where did you go do your law work? I was at Stanford Law School. I decided, not out of the noblest of motives, but that going to law school would enable me to keep the greatest number of options open and allow me to postpone the decision of what I would do by way of career. And there was a wonderful professor of constitutional law, Gerald Gunther, uh, under whom I studied, and my interest in constitutional law 
ended up merging with my interest in public service, so it was natural for me at the conclusion of my law studies to apply to be a deputy attorney general in the California Department of Justice, and I was hired by then Attorney General Stanley Mosk, who later ended up many years later being a colleague of mine on the California Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, in, in your career of public service, I should mention that uh, uh, in addition to being uh, Chief Justice for 14 years, uh, you're, when we look at your career, 38 years on the bench and a total of 45 years of public service. And you, I think in Latin we used to call it the cursus honorum, the, the paths upward. And, and you really uh, saw the law from all sides as a municipal judge, as a deputy attorney general, superior court, then Supreme Court. And, and you were pointed by uh, four different uh, governors of both parties. Yes, that's correct. And in terms of exposure to the law, I was very fortunate even before going on the bench, which was shortly after my 32nd birthday, by having extraordinary good fortune in the California Department of Justice. I managed to represent the state of California but before the United States Supreme Court in arguments in six cases, and that gave me a top to bottom view, and then later on, of course, starting at the bottom, uh, municipal court of the court system. So it was very, very fortunate, and the office was smaller then, and I was able to uh, be given those cases and devote as much time and energy as I wished to. In, in, a, in a speech, I think it, uh, when, when you left uh, your position as Chief Justice, you, you told a group of lawyers public that, that about the commitment to public service dedicated to strengthening and upholding the rule of law, that that had guided you throughout your career. Yes, that's really, I think, the hallmark of our democracy is adherence to the rule of law. And without that, I really think we uh, cannot claim to have a democratic form of government. And uh, that experience that I had at all these different levels certainly reinforced that. And then when I came to be a justice of the Supreme Court, first as an associate justice, later as uh, chief justice, that was constantly on my mind as I had to face laws, some of which I thought were silly or foolish, but it was my obligation not to impose my own personal views, but rather to follow the law. And on the other hand, uh, sometimes with great regret having to invalidate uh, convictions or judgments uh, or actually declare unconstitutional various statutes that I might have personally favored because they ran afoul of the Constitution. So that Adherence to the rule of law is, I think, a vital uh, aspect, of course, of any judge's duties. Uh, I think uh, students who watch this program might be interested in understanding uh, what goes into legal thinking and judicial deliberation. And uh, maybe a way to get hold of this uh, question is to ask you, what do you see as the skills really uh, involved in doing the law well uh, uh, in, in these different roles that the system requires? Well, of course, uh, first and foremost is putting aside one's own personal views. And I think uh, as a trial judge, most judges recognize that often they have heard one side of the case and they find it very convincing, but they learn to suspend judgment until they've heard the other side and that may flip them around uh, in the end or cause them to take some middle course. Uh, there's a need for great preparation. There's so much law out there and sometimes there are conflicting principles and then trying to decide with proper respect for precedent, what is the current state of the law and how does the current case fit into it? And often it's not a perfect fit. So these are uh, very, very, uh, you know, d difficult tasks at first, but one learns to listen and to probe and to conduct one's own research, not rely merely upon the attorneys, the advocates representing both sides to try to come out with a result that is fair and just 
and at the same time adheres to what the law is. It's not just a question of barnyard equity of who you know, deserves to win in the abstract, but to make that determination under the law. It seems that there is a, a challenge here to actually be informed about the history of a subject, but also to, to have a sense of, of how the culture and the society is changing as one deliberates and, and makes decisions. Is that a fair assessment? Well, it is. You know, the concept of an evolving constitution has been much debated. And uh, some people, of course, criticize that concept and say, if you take that approach, you're just uh, without any kind of guidance. It's sort of a rudderless course. On the other hand, the Constitution is clearly a living document. And we apply the Fourth Amendment restraint against unre unreasonable searches and seizures to electronic surveillance, which of course could not even have been contemplated when the framers composed those words in the 18th century. So there is a certain need to uh, adapt and apply principles that were set up broadly to changing conditions and also to, uh, not just in terms of interpreting the Constitution, to try to figure out what the legislature meant, or even more difficult sometimes, what the people meant in passing an initiative. And you have conflicts and ambiguities, and that can be a major uh, preoccupation uh, for courts of last resort. And, and I guess also what must come into play, obviously, is logic, because what you conclude has to, to make sense and, and be understood by, by uh, rational uh, citizens. So there, there's logic on the one hand, but, but there's also language. Language strikes me as, as something that is very, re really important as you need to be very precise in articulating the issues and, and the conclusions you're reaching. No, that's so true. And when I would work on opinions I was authoring for the court, I, I might spend many, many minutes just deciding where a comma should be placed because uh, the tea leaves are, are examined very carefully by lower courts, uh, by our court at a future reading, uh, by lawyers and by our citizens. So uh, everything that we write has to be viewed not just in terms of how it resolves the particular dispute before us, but how the rule that we come out with, which is our major function, setting forth rules uh, by way of precedent, will guide parties and be interpreted in future years. Mm -hmm. What about judicial uh, and legal temperament? Uh, what, what, is, there a, is there a recommended temperament or character uh, for doing the law well? Well, certainly there has to be an ability and willingness to listen and sometimes to compromise one's position because after all, uh, as I said a moment ago, the purpose of our written opinions is to provide guidance. And if a court is splintered, as the United States Supreme Court is more frequently than the California Supreme Court. It doesn't provide guidance if all that the reader can say at the end is, well, they did uphold the judgment or they set aside the judgment. We try very, very hard and it's rare. It happens only every few years, maybe once or twice, that we don't have a majority of the court that is four or more of the seven justices on the same opinion. There may be separate concurrences or dissenting opinions, but we want people to understand what is uh, the rule that we're putting down. And uh, to achieve that, often there are compromises. And I think that to the extent a court speaks unanimously or with fewer 
uh, separate opinions and provides much better guidance. And I always said uh, when I was on the court, I don't stop counting when I get to four, a majority of our seven justices. If I have six votes, including my own, and uh, there's somebody out there who has a problem with one paragraph, if without weakening or uh, reducing the quality of the court's opinion, I can satisfy the concern of that seventh person and bring him or her on board, I've achieved something by way of providing uh, clear guidance to the readers of the opinion in the future. So, so really, as, as we look back on what you just said, it, it's really ju judicial uh, thinking and deliberation is, is really a, a complex dynamic of values, of principles, of, of your background, of what's going on in the world, and, and of history, really. It, it is. Everybody brings uh, his or her own experience, uh, but on the other hand, has to put aside personal views and uh, follow what the law is. And also, I would add to what I just said momentarily, that this function is greatly facilitated if the disagreements uh, can be resolved agreeably uh, so that there isn't any personal or ad hominem difference uh, in terms of what one justice may feel on a given issue and that of another. And to recognize the good faith and intellectual validity of competing points of view and trying to resolve those among the justices. And I think our California Supreme Court is very, very successful on that, and I think I can speak for all the justices by uh, commenting that we were and remained good friends, no matter the more contentious issues, whatever, and we kept it off a personal level. Now, as Chief Justice of California, you were not only head of the California Supreme Court, but also head of the Judicial uh, Council. What is the Judicial Council, and, and what did that job in, entail in addition to the job of being Chief Justice of the Court? The Judicial Council of California is a body established in the California Constitution, and it is given the responsibility for the statewide administration of justice. There are matters which are and remain matters of local concern, but the basic issues, the dispensation of funding for the courts, uh, formulating policies, rules, taking positions on legislative matters, uh, those are matters given to the Judicial Council by way of responsibility, and the Chief Justice chairs that body and appoints the judicial members who comprise the vast majority of the members. And being Chief Justice of California involves not only writing one th one's uh, one-seventh share of the opinions on the court, but also heading the branch, which is probably the largest law-trained judiciary uh, in the world, uh, certainly in the Western world. And I use law-trained because there are some uh, countries where laypersons serve on tribunals. But we have 1,750 judges, uh, judicial positions, which is double the number in the Article III federal judiciary. We have about 21,000 court employees, plus about three to 400 court commissioners, and a budget of almost $4 billion. And all of that entails traveling around the state and having countless meetings with legislators individually and with the governor to resolve matters of policy and budget. So uh, this is a whole uh, another agenda uh, in addition to what we normally think of judicial leadership, that is being head of the court. You, you really are uh, leading uh, a major institution in all of its uh, elements. It is, and I soon realized that my workload basically tripled or quadrupled from when I was an associate justice of the California Supreme Court to when I became chief justice of the court and of the state. And and I, uh, you, you, uh, in the in the beginning of assuming this role. I gather you, you traveled over time to all 58 California counties, 
Uh, I read somewhere that it was a 13,000-mile journey where you, you, I guess, had to put your ear to the ground and find out what, what was in this domain and what needed to be done to change it for the better. Exactly. Uh, I became Chief Justice on May 1st of 1996, uh, Law Day, symbolically, and two weeks later I was before a joint session of the California Legislature at their invitation giving what became an annual State of the Judiciary Address to a joint session. And in the first of those speeches, I made a commitment that I jokingly say uh, some think I should have been committed for making, <laughs> and that was that I would <clears throat> visit the courts in all of California's counties uh, to get a better idea of what the current situation was, the problems, the solutions. Even though I had many years of experience as a trial judge, it was confined to my uh, county uh, of Los Angeles, and I wanted to know how things were around the state to develop best practices to try to obtain help from the other two branches of government in resolving difficulties faced by the legislature. So that was a 13,000 mile journey and I completed it uh, in a year. And and what, what you found was a system uh, w with a, a high quality of personnel, but but institutionally was in disarray, with a lot of inequalities, and and you set then three goals. What were those goals, and and what was done uh, to both increase efficiency and, and make the system work better? Well, first of all, in terms of the situation, I found I found that the dispensation of justice, which I believe is one of the most important functions of government, varied tremendously from county to county depending upon a couple of things. First of all, the ability and willingness of a particular county to adequately fund its courts in the face of competing demands for libraries, health clinics, uh, law enforcement, etc. And it also depended upon whether whoever was on the board of supervisors of the particular county that year had a good or a poor relationship with whoever was presiding judge of the individual court that year. So politics. Politics, <laughs> basically, and, uh, and resources, and that that was not appropriate. So in the course of this journey, I realized that there were tremendous differences in procedures, in resources, in the quality of the physical uh, buildings. So the three structural reforms that followed, and I'm very proud of that as uh, certainly my main uh, administrative legacy probably, was having the legislature agree to switch the funding source for our trial courts from the counties to the state of California. Secondly, to avoid duplication and make better use of the resources for the benefit of the taxpayers and citizens of the state, to merge the 220 municipal and superior courts in the state into one level of trial court, namely a superior court in each county, because you'd go into a courthouse and you'd see at different ends of the courthouse municipal civil filing, superior civil filing, same for criminal, same for jury pools, interpreter services, purchasing of supplies, municipal court judges being done with their short cause matters and going home early in the afternoon when the superior court judges were facing cases uh, uh, up against dismissal uh, on speedy uh, trial provisions. And then thirdly, and finally of these three structural reforms, uh, transferring the uh, 530 some court facilities in the state from county maintenance and county ownership to the state of California under judicial branch management. And there are some incredible sites that, uh, uh, if you're interested in going into them, that I. I mean, t have. tell us one story of what shocked you most in terms of uh, the situation in a particular place, without naming it, and 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 uh, what a what an affront to kind of the process. Well, one matter was the matter of. Um, jury facilities and uh, there were places that didn't just have a bad jury assembly room with maybe insufficient seating or leaky ceilings but also uh, that uh, had none so I saw a place where jurors who then had to serve 
uh, two weeks instead of our one day or one trial mode that we changed it to later by way of reform, who for two weeks were standing outside on the uh, sidewalk, sometimes with umbrellas while it was raining, or another place where they were seated on the concrete steps of a stairwell and had to move to the side when uh, prisoners were brought down. Uh, in one place, a uh, court commissioner constructed a courtroom uh, out of his own wood shop, constructed the bench and the jury assembly room when they cobbled together some space out of a maintenance closet in the hallway. Uh, another place where a judge had piled law books around uh, the bench because it had been the scene of an attempted um, hostage taking and when I complimented him on apparently being such a scholar he said oh no he said that's in lieu of the metal shield that we can't <laughs> afford here uh, you you make the point in in something that you wrote or a speech you gave somewhere that that well, what we're talking about in all of this is ensuring the integrity and independence of, uh, of the judiciary as, a, as a, a third branch of the government in, in our democratic system. And, and you talk about the importance of decisional independence and institutional independence. Talk a little about that, because they really are both extremely important for the, the integrity and identity of the court system. To the extent that people ponder the independence of the judiciary, they usually focus upon decisional independence, which is so important. It distinguishes our country from formerly communist countries and some third world countries where they have what is called telephone justice. The government calls the judge and tells him or her how to decide a case. Um, or there just isn't uh, an ability or willingness to stand up to political or other uh, pressures. Uh, it's vital, as we discussed earlier, that the rule of law be adhered to. But without institutional independence, without courts having the ability to carry out their function by way of provision of adequate resources by the other two branches of government, having adequate facilities uh, and, and technology and um, just money to carry out programs, decisional independence isn't possible. So they're really uh, two different sides of the same coin and uh, we can't have an independent functioning uh, judiciary without having that independence. As I review your accomplishments, and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm struck by uh, the sense in which in these two roles that you played, there, there's a real, there, there's a, a political skill set and a diplomatic skill set that, that uh, uh, because this is, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying the court was politicized. I'm just saying that you have to deal with a lot of actors in the system to make this function. I, I'm curious, what, what, were, what was the, the source in your background that led you to be uh, so able, if I might say, in, in, in these two areas? Well, it was really born out of necessity, and I saw what a very poor relationship the California Supreme Court and the judiciary had generally with the legislature. So I made it my task, and it took several years to build up the kind of personal relationships with members of the legislature and with the various governors with whom I worked uh, to try to sell them on the importance of adequate funding and adequate policy making vis-a-vis -vis the judiciary. And it was difficult often to have to separate that diplomatic or administrative or political function from the decision making. Because once I went up there, I was basically, as a couple of them said good naturedly, uh, you know, one of the more high powered lobbyists, but uh, lobbying for the judiciary, but really for the people's right of access to justice. And I couldn't let how I would vote on my own cases as a Supreme Court justice be influenced by the whether what I would do uh, would please or displease the legislature or the governor who often were parties uh, to the lawsuits that I was deciding. So it really was a pragmatic approach born out of necessity as I say 
and perhaps the diplomatic training uh, that I aspired to earlier in my career uh, came to some use in that function. So you, you became a diplomat in the judiciary as opposed to a diplomat in the Foreign Service. That's correct, and frankly, there were many disparate elements of the judiciary, too. Uh, judges are rooted in the past, maybe because we're trained to follow precedent. So a lot of these changes uh, in structure had to be brought about with a combination of carrots and sticks in terms of judges not being always entirely enthusiastic about going ahead into the 21st century. So uh, again, the diplomatic skills there, and uh, I tried to also uh, apply such skills in my role as Chief Justice on the court, just in terms of keeping the atmosphere very collegial, trying to compromise uh, on decisions to arrive at the best result. Uh, we're talking at a time when the world is really changing in the Middle East, and we're seeing a lot of revolutions, but what is going to have to follow is institution building. Uh, especially as some of these countries uh, develop an independent judiciary, are there are there lessons here? I mean, it would seem that that kind of it, it's 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 really a complicated process to not only have courts that are independent, but to maintain them and and fix them so they evolve over time. No, it's a very complicated process, and in that process I described of going up to Sacramento and having countless one-on-one -on -one meetings with legislators and governors, I found that uh, I had to constantly reinforce the lesson that we have three independent, although really codependent, uh, branches of government. And that's a concept that very disturbingly uh, is not well understood by many Americans. And there were polls not too long ago in which adult Americans were asked to name the three branches of government, and two out of three were unable to do so. One out of three could not name even a single branch. I believe in one poll they found that more people could name the three stooges by name than could name the three branches of government. And to me, this has great ramifications in terms of Americans not being aware often of their rights and responsibilities as individual citizens, let alone the functioning of their government. And perhaps even more ironically, this comes at a time when we are reporting to export our system of democracy with its uh, focus on judicial independence and the role of access to justice in government to new or emerging nations. So if we don't really understand it ourselves, uh, how are we in a position to export it? So I think we have to do more training in the way of civics of our high school students, especially at that level and middle school students and uh, do a better job than we have been in terms of civics and not just focus on math and science, which are crucial, but also on civics. Uh, the, the law evolves, as you uh, just uh, told us, and, but, but what you're pointing out as head of the Judicial Council is the institutions, actually, of the law have to evolve, which is very important. And, and when you came in as the Chief Justice, uh, 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 a new level of diversity was blossoming in California. And then, uh, in terms of our political economy, we were seeing a society with greater inequalities and so on. And we just had uh, Robert Reich on this program uh, talking about that aspect of our political economy. How did the California, in, in what ways did the, the institution of the law, the courts, the the uh, the various uh, ways of administering justice have to change in in that context during your tenure. Well, I think in a couple of ways. First of all, there had to be a change in the somewhat insular attitude that um, judges should just stay in their black robes in their ivory towers or chambers. Uh, my outreach to the whole state going around to visiting the courts involved also meeting with community groups in different areas. I continued that. Many other courts developed outreach programs, and I brought the California Supreme Court on the road, basically. So we held sessions 
discussions in all sorts of small communities around the state, invited students in, let them ask questions of us, and so forth. So that was a major aspect of it. And um, I think we have to also view the courts in a different fashion from before in that we are service oriented. We want to know what the public needs, how we can provide access to justice. And it sometimes involves having information on how the court system works, available when you walk into the courthouse. Where is the nearest domestic violence shelter? Having drug uh, courts, special courts for veterans and so forth thinking outside the box and I think we've been very successful in California in doing that. And, and do you wind up then having uh, formats other than a courtroom with a judge in robe and so on to because a, a lot of this is about conflict resolution uh, uh, and so on. Yes, uh, one does. In fact, uh, there are some specialty courthouses that provide, let's say, a unified approach to a family. You may have the father who is in criminal court because he beat up his wife, and they may also be going through a uh, marital disillusion. Maybe she's also trying to get a restraining order in the domestic violence court. Maybe one child is a juvenile delinquent and another one is a dependent who may be removed from the home. And we try to approach things in some of these emerging courts on a global level and not just look at one slice of the problem. And also some of these courts that have dealt with drug problems or veterans problems, having social services agencies right there in the uh, court building so that the problem can be dealt with systemically and not just on an overly narrow legal basis. Uh, someplace I read that in California there are a hundred languages uh, uh, used in in different proceedings uh, throughout the state. Yes, in any given year, more than 100 languages are translated in our California courts. So obviously, how can there be access in some of the more fundamental ways if you don't even have the ability to understand what's going on? So we've been vastly increasing the number of uh, trained interpreters to perform that function. Uh, to what extent does the law in California get influenced by the cultural mores and, and bodies of law that uh, immigrants uh, bring to uh, the state? Uh, does that happen, and is it gradual over time, or what? Well, we have programs, a very active judicial education program in California, that um, take into account the rich cultural diversity of our state and that point out the need for sensitivity on behalf of judges to the different backgrounds and mores and ways of looking at things uh, of our very diverse population. And just to give you one easy example, in many Asian cultures it is considered impolite to more or less stare somebody uh, in the face, to look at them eyeball to eyeball, and it's viewed as more appropriate to divert one's gaze. But in our Anglo-Saxon culture, we often view uh, the lack of eye contact, the ability to, uh, you know, sort of avert the eyes instead of looking the person head on, uh, as a lack of candor uh, being indicated, uh, or as of some uh, sign of duplicity. So judges are trained to recognize those cultural differences and to try to be fair and accessible to all the different uh, and diverse population that comes to the court instead of applying stereotypes. And we developed a committee on access and fairness which takes into account the need to avoid all sorts of bias, whether it's gender bias, cultural, racial bias, or uh, based on sexual orientation, any bias of that sort. It, it does, does the judiciary have the problem that all institutions have in, in terms of getting personnel 
to change their thinking, to move beyond ways of doing it, the, the process uh, to, to adapt to this new world that's emerging? Uh, there is always some difficulties, but I have found uh, judges and court personnel uh, far more receptive to change than when I became a judge uh, back in 1972. We've gotten away from stereotypical thinking, and I think many people are very enthusiastic about trying to perform our function of providing access to justice in new and different and more effective ways. So. Uh, that is facilitated by a very active educational program, both for judges and also court officers and court employees, even those at the counter in terms of how people who come into the court building are dealt with. And, and technology is also an actor in all of this. Uh, I, two things come to mind. One is the, the introduction of DNA, which one sees in all of these uh, uh, programs on television talking about the law. Perry Mason didn't have DNA uh, to bring to the courtroom at the last minute. And then on the other hand, websites, because I know that, that uh, the Judicial Council in California has created a website to, to actually bring access to a new level. Yes, we're very proud of the fact that we have a nationally recognized and award-winning website that provides assistance to the self-represented litigants who are so frequently appearing now increasingly in our California courts. In some parts of the state, 80 to 90 percent of the litigants who appear on family law matters involving child custody, child support, marital dissolution, have no lawyer. So we get millions of hits uh, every year on our self-help website, which goes beyond just the legal procedures, but again, how to get to the domestic violence uh, shelter, other helpful information. And, and what about DNA? In other words, has that, has that uh, been as great a problem in California, introducing it, the, the fact that it leads to the overturning of, of proceedings where people were uh, innocently convicted? They were innocent and convicted? I don't think it is uh, that uh, much of a problem as such. Uh, all new scientific advances are subject to strict legal standards in terms of the admissibility of evidence because despite DNA, which is now quite well recognized, there is all sorts of junk science out there too. So there are standards that a judge has to uh, apply and go through before making a determination that certain scientific evidence will or will not be admissible, and uh, if that's just one more way of re-examining a conviction to determine whether years later whether some miscarriage of justice was applied. Let's look at, at two issues that, that are relevant uh, today to get a better understanding of the factors that a judge has to weigh. One, one is the California Constitution itself, and we uh, ha are uh, blessed or cursed with an initiative process. Uh, talk a little about that, and, and what, what are the implications of that uh, for the, the constitutional system of California and, and also for the judiciary? Well, the initiative process is largely responsible for California having what has been described as a constitution exceeded in its length and complexity only by the Constitution of India. And uh, to give you an illustration, uh, the United States Constitution has been amended not counting the Bill of Rights, the Ten Amendments that were adopted about three years after the initial Constitution, I believe only 17 times. California's Constitution has been amended more than 500 times, and it's exceedingly easy to do so. Now, this has not always been by way of initiative, but some of the difficulties that we have today in the dysfunctionality of California's government structure uh, causing fiscal and budgetary issues has been the result of measures adopted by way of initiative. 
and uh, there are suggestions that uh, this reform, which was part of the progressive movement in the early 1900s, uh, needs not to be eliminated, but uh, needs to be improved upon so that it would not be that easy to qualify something for the ballot or to have it pass, especially when it involves fundamental rights. And we have all sorts of stuff in our Constitution that doesn't belong there. One prime example brought in by initiative is a a prohibition on uh, gill netting and, and uh, catching uh, rockfish and, and certain regulations that are explicitly applicable only north of Point Arguello. In my view, that does not belong in a constitution. So I think we really need to re-examine the initiative process and see if uh, we can make some reforms there. And, and our, our budgetary gridlock now really results from a, a series of, of initiatives. Uh, and uh, as you just pointed out, ironically, the it was a, a progressive notion to have this initiative process. And so but what's fascinating is the way in which uh, the, the law is really a, 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 a a place to really understand the complexity of human nature and human enterprise, where what was once seen as a good has, has become problematic. Yes, see, what happened, uh, the progressive movement, I think South Dakota was the first state, 1898, I believe, that brought in the initiative process along with the recall and referendum from Switzerland. So we don't just get good chocolate and watches, we got the initiative <laughs> process from Switzerland too. And then California came uh, a dozen or so years later. And the objective was to get around special interests. And in California, the Southern Pacific Railroad controlled the California legislature. This is not hyperbole, they really did. And it was business organizations that were behind the initiative to get around the railroads. But after a while, uh, although there were some populist uses uh, of the initiative process over the years, special interests began to learn how they could employ the initiative process to further their objectives, which sort of reverses the whole concept of why the initiative process was being used. And sometimes there would be dueling initiatives, there would be deliberately ambiguous ones that uh, the courts had to spend years grappling with, trying to figure out what they meant. So uh, unfortunately, it was sort of turned upside down, and I think it performs a valuable function, but I think it's gotten very much out of hand. From this discussion, I conclude that you don't carry the California Constitution around in your back pocket. No, Hugo uh, <laughs> uh, Black uh, used to do that proudly, and I'm afraid... The U.S. I would, Constitution. Uh, yeah, he, he would for the uh, U.S. Constitution, and if I tried to do that with the California Constitution, I'm afraid I'd have some lower back and disc problems. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a good way to talk about the, the, the dynamic of cultural change, societal change, uh, is the, the, the series of uh, decisions at, at, in, in different parts of the uh, political and legal system with, with regard to this question of, of gay marriage. Let's talk a little about that, and it, it, it's not so much what the decision was, but, but give us a sense of the, the complexity involved in weighing all the factors in the initial decision, you know, in the subsequent decision, and so on. Well, there were three decisions that the California Supreme Court rendered, and I authored the majority opinion in each of them, and together I think they uh, form a very illuminating lesson in civics in, in the function of the three branches of government. The first decision, the Lockyer decision, involved whether or not an executive official of a local community, in this case the mayor of San Francisco, could take it upon himself to issue marriage licenses to persons of the same gender because of his belief that those statutes were unconstitutional. And our court held in that first 
decision that that was not permissible, that the remedy was to go to court, file a lawsuit if you believe the statute is unconstitutional. You couldn't just take it upon yourself to decide which laws you would or would not apply out of your own uh, well-held, uh, sincerely held beliefs. So a lawsuit was filed and the trial court ruled that the statutes were unconstitutional. The Court of Appeal reversed that by a two to one vote and then our California Supreme Court by a four to three vote held that the statutes were unconstitutional uh, and um, that uh, involved both a statute passed by the legislature and one passed by the initiative process. So the first decision of course illustrated a limitation on the executive uh, power, the second on the legislative power. What happened then? Well, the decision in that second case, in Ray marriage cases, was based on the California Constitution. And the people of the state of California exercised their right to amend their Constitution. And once they did, the issue was before us uh, at the California Supreme Court in the third case, the Strauss case, uh, to determine whether or not there was any limitation on the people's right to amend their constitution. And there were no issues raised under the federal constitution by either side, so we had to base it entirely on the federal constitution, on the state constitution, not the federal constitution. And we determined that, lo and behold, here was the third round that illustrated a limitation on the judicial power because the court was bound to follow the state constitution even to the extent that it was uh, setting aside part of our earlier ruling because we were now faced with a different constitutional provision. So that is sort of a three-part lesson in civics all through the question of marriage that um, showed that the court was doing its very best with sincerely held views uh, on both sides of the issues to uh, try to apply the law as the justices saw it to be. And, and is, is, it seems that the lesson would be that, that if, uh, if it's a republic and you've got to keep it uh, by working at it, that, that people have to learn to live with the complexity of the democratic dynamic, essentially. Uh, they do, but I think when Ben Franklin issued those famous words, uh, it's a republic if we can keep it, he could not have envisaged what would happen with the initiative process because aside from a democracy, a republic of course implies the people acting through their elected uh, representatives and if you are governing excessively through the initiative process, you detract from the sense of responsibility of legislators, especially when they're being subject to term limits too, and direct democracy in the sense of making so many fundamental decisions by the people directly without the expertise and fact-finding and hearings and so forth that's engaged in the legislative process, despite whatever faults it has, is counterproductive to the idea of a republic, which implies acting not directly and putting everything to the people's vote. Are you surprised by the change in public attitudes toward public service these days? Because we've gone for, you know, public service as a, uh, uh, as, as a high, the highest or one of the highest callings when you entered uh, uh, public service to a time when it seems that uh, there are groups out there that, that basically want government to go away? I don't know if it's just frustration. Uh, you know, every time uh, things take a bad economic downturn, I think there's more disillusionment, more cynicism with government. And I think that government is not the enemy. I think we have to do our best to improve the procedures to eliminate waste and unnecessary regulation. but. Government will always hold a key role, and I think it's very naive to think that we can just dispense uh, with formal government. And another poll indicated that people have more confidence 
in the laws that they pass by way of initiative in California than they do uh, with laws that are vetted through the legislative and executive branch. And I find that rather unrealistic, at least going on the basis of my experience as a judge. And uh, not that everything that comes out of the legislature is always a paragon of clarity, but uh, they're much better considered in terms of fact gathering and, and clarity usually than the initiatives are. After this 45 uh, years of public service, uh, has your view of humanity and human nature, uh, in what way has it changed and are, are you more optimistic or pessimistic about our future? That's a difficult uh, situation, um, but I know that uh, I have great faith in the jury system. There I can speak less equivocally. And one of the highlights in my career as a trial judge was being faced with a case known as the Hillside Strangler trial. And um, I refused the prosecutor's motion to dismiss the 10 counts of murder in the serial murder case and uh, turned it over from the DA to the attorney general. And I felt that the jury system should be allowed to run its course and that I could not uh, properly be a rubber stamp for either the prosecutor or the defense counsel. And the jurors slogged through this for two years and two days. And uh, there were counts even in addition to the 10 charge murders, others, and they came up with the best decision. They convicted on the nine strongest counts and acquitted on the one week count and they showed up there every week and had to be sequestered uh, the last month during their deliberation. So this to me was a graphic illustration of the faith that we can and, and should have in the jury system, even though it's not perfect, but it's a very important buffer between the state and the individual uh, facing uh, criminal charges. Uh, I would continue to have a lot of faith in the people's role in, in their form of government, provided that we could just improve the level, level of civics education. And I think uh, that to exercise their rights, people have to be better informed. At, and when they are, I think they basically come around to uh, the right decision. One final question. How would you advise students who watch this uh, interview to prepare for their future? Well, I would hope that they would uh, recognize that despite the need to develop some expertise and specialty uh, in whatever pursuit, how very important it is to be aware of the vastly expanding fields of knowledge in so many different areas and to really be uh, citizens of uh, not only many different disciplines but of the world and be aware of things outside their own parochial surroundings and consider themselves uh, not just members of a given profession or trade uh, and not just citizens of one particular country but uh, uh, persons who really have a widespread interest in all the issues facing humanity. Uh, on that note, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, I want to thank you very much for coming on our program. Well, I enjoyed our discussion thoroughly. It was a great honor uh, that you would share this uh, very fascinating odyssey with us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.